Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about the joy of a generous heart. The joy of having a generous heart. Let's look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say about a generous heart. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. Proverbs 11, 24, and 25 in the New International Version says it this way. One person gives freely and yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly. And it's like, I think one translation said, he hoards, a hoarder. Have you ever watched the television program about hoarding? But the hoarder comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will himself or herself be refreshed. It's kind of just the opposite of what the world thinks. The world thinks get all you can while you can, hoard it, keep it for yourself, look out for number one. But the Bible says God blesses the generous soul. He who waters others, he who keeps giving from a generous heart will continue to be refreshed. One person said it this way, you cannot outgive God. Amen? You cannot outgive God. Luke, let's look at Luke 638. Jesus spoke these words. Our Lord Jesus Christ spoke these beautiful words. Luke 638. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down. God, you're learning to trust. Then you make a tablespoon and you say, you know what? God's been taking care of me. And you know what? I've learned something. You start giving with a and uh, uh, what do they call those things? A ladle. <laughs> and pretty soon you're giving with a shovel. Hallelujah. Because you cannot outgive God. And the more you give, the more he shovels back to you. And we're not just talking about money, by the way, as we'll see in just a moment. But I love this season of the year because it is a season of generosity. You know, it's, uh, the song says, to the season to be jolly. Fa la 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 la. But it's also the season to be generous. Somebody say it with me. It's the season to be generous. I love when I see the Salvation Army uh, ringing the bell for the, doing the most good and giving to others. I love to pass by and put something in that bucket because I've seen the work they do, and they're a wonderful organization. There's something, something so special about having an outwardly focused life, a life that's not just focused on yourself all the time. I remember one time I was going through a depression, and my wife suggested that I call this very saintly lady, an older woman we used to call her Grandma Jane. And uh, she was in the church for many years and always had a word of encouragement. So I said, well, let me call her. And I started explaining to her my problem, my burden, that I was really hurting and I was feeling discouraged. And so she stopped me and said, you know, Pastor, I would feel the same way if I was always thinking about myself. And I said, oh, ouch. Ouch, that hurt. Amen. But it was needed. Amen. I needed it. So an outwardly focused life is a key to having joy, having happiness, yes, 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 yes. giving to others. He who refreshes others. You know, there's so many ways. Even the world knows this. Even the world says what goes around comes around. The world says pay it forward. There's so many movies on TV. Uh, it's a Wonderful Life. Talks about how in the end... Uh, what was his name? Mr. Bailey? Right. Mr. Bailey got everything back, and all the good that he had done came back to him. Are you with me this morning? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. One of my favorite ones is the Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge. I just love that movie, and especially the old version from the 1930s. It was one of the first ones that came out. We're at the end of the movie after he realizes what a miserable life he had, and he thought his life was over, and he goes and sees the angel of death, and he sees his tombstone in this nightmarish dream that he's having. He suddenly, at the end of all that, 
He's scared to death. He wakes up and he realizes it was just a dream and he's still alive and he still has a chance to do some good. Hallelujah. This morning you're still alive. Hallelujah. You're in the land of the living. Let's do all the good we can do while we can. Hallelujah. I love the part where he starts jumping and screaming and singing and he doesn't know what to do with himself because he suddenly discovered the key to happiness. He starts throwing money out the window and he tells someone to go buy something for yourself. And then the housekeeper comes in and she's afraid of him because he's such a mean old uh, nasty man. And he starts kissing her and hugging her and dancing and she runs out screaming because she thinks he's, she's, uh, he's lost his mind. It's just, and then he tries to stand on his head. He doesn't know what to do with himself because of the joy of realizing I still have a chance to be a blessing to somebody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You still, I still have a chance today. I don't know about you, but that makes me, that in itself makes me feel happy. Just knowing that I can do something for somebody that's less fortunate. Even Brother Joe and I were talking about it earlier, about words, kind words. You know, just a word of encouragement. It doesn't cost you a dime. But just saying to somebody, you know what, I've been praying for you. I've been thinking about you. I just wanted to make sure, are you okay? You've been in my heart. You've been in my prayer. Just a few kind words can change somebody's whole day. Are you with me today? There have been many studies done by the world about the level of happiness that people have. And they found scientifically that those who tend to give more to charities and volunteer more of their time are consistently more happy and less depressed. That's a secular study. That's not a Christian study. That's a, 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 the world telling you this. Giving helps us to live longer. In the Journal of Health Psychology magazine in 2012, a study published found that people who regularly volunteer and give of themselves lived longer. But there was a catch. It had to be for unselfish reasons. In other words, they didn't give with the motivation of getting back. They just gave for the joy of giving. And they found that they actually had long-term health benefits, lived longer. And the last one I, li I love a lot, it says, giving gives meaning to your life. People who are generous on a regular basis have the realization that being a giving person gives them a sense of meaning. You know, there are many stories told about, you know, families that are very wealthy and they have a bunch of children and the children are very spoiled, right? Because they have all this wealth and they got all the toys they need and, and they're talking back to their parents and they're very, very nasty because they don't appreciate anything they have. Of course, that's none of us because we're all perfect in here, right? I mean, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding around. But then... The parent has an awakening. One of the parents says, you know what? We're going to put away all the toys, and we're going to buy toys for a poor family down the street. We're going to find somebody. We're going to go to a homeless shelter, and we're going to go serve at the soup kitchen, uh, the soup line. And, and, and the kids at first are protesting. Are you kidding? Are you serious? What if the kids at school find out about that? That's not cool. And, you know, no, we're going to do this. And they go and do it, and they, they, they serve, and they give to others, and they make friends with some of the people down at the homeless shelter, and they find out that the kids are uh, the next week going to their parents and saying, can we do that again? Can we do that again? They're actually pestering their parents because they want to go back. Why? Because they found something more meaningful than that just themselves. Don't you want to live for something that's bigger than yourself? Hallelujah. Aren't you glad this morning that the Christian is a part of something that's greater than his individual part? We're just playing a part in it. But the kingdom of God is forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. Thank God we have a God who is generous. Aren't you glad that our God is not moody? God didn't get up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. God is not like the mythical gods of the Greeks. And the ancients who had gods who had multiple personality. They had personality disorders. They had gods who were depressed. Gods who were angry all the time. 
gods who were looking to, to strike you down. And so you had to be afraid of them all the time. And you weren't sure if you were ever forgiven. But we don't have a God like that. We have a Father in heaven who loves us. Hallelujah. How many of you are thankful for our God? Is a loving God, a giving God. For God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. God is a giving God. Paul teaches the Corinthian church about the virtue of being generous. 2 Corinthians 8, 9. For you know the grace or the gifting of our Lord Jesus Christ, generosity of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Wow, that's just the opposite of the world's thinking. Jesus emptied of himself of all of his divine prerogatives. He was sitting in the throne next to the throne of God in heaven. The Bible says he came to earth with none of his royal garments. He wasn't born in a palace. He laid aside all of his dignity and all of his rights and was born as a child, had to be taken care of by earthly parents. He lived as a spirit-filled man. He was 100% divine, but 100% human. He experienced being poor. He experienced working hard. He experienced the suffering and the anguish that people go through. And even betrayal and hatred and jealousy and all of those things. And yet he gave himself so that, to us so that you and I could be free from our sins. So you and I who were poor, who were lost, who were separated from God, could be brought near to the throne of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We were alienated from God. We were strangers, the Bible says. It says that we were actually under God's wrath, dead in our trespasses and sins. Are you getting a very depressed picture of our state without Christ? We were pretty messed up without Jesus. But he who is rich in mercy, because of his love for us, and even while we were yet sinners, Brother Joe, he died for us. Can you say amen? God not only is the greatest giver, but he keeps on giving. You know, somebody made a commercial, the gift that keeps on giving. I don't know which one it is. It's not chocolate, that's for sure. <laughs> He'll not I'm not even going to go there. I got a story about that, but I'll leave that alone. But here's what it says in Romans 8.32, if we could look at that scripture. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, so that's something he's already done, how will he not also, everybody say also, also what? Along with him, graciously give us all things. He gives us everything we need for a godly life, everything we need for a sense of wholeness. He grants us peace. He grants us purpose. He grants us a clear conscience. Can you say amen this morning? He may not give me everything I want, but I can be confident that he will give me everything I need. He may not give me everything I want, but he will give me everything I need for true love, joy, peace, and fulfillment. Take this whole world, but give me Jesus. Hallelujah. No turning back, no turning back. See, God can give you the things the world can never give you. That's why you have people sometimes who are wealthy, movie stars, famous people, athletes, whatever they are in such a state of depression, and they have everything. They have everything, but they're not happy. True happiness comes in knowing Jesus. And true happiness comes from an outwardly focused life. I'm praying this morning that somebody's mind's going to be turned inside out. Somebody who is too self-conscious is going to become more God-conscious because that's the key to happiness. The key to happiness is be more outwardly focused. So I'm praying that God will turn your heart inside out and your thinking inside out. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, in the Amplified Version says, Christ died for all, 
so that those who live, that's us, would no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and was raised again to life. We who are alive, Christ died for all so that we who live should no longer live for ourselves. This is the word of God. This is not pop psychology. Somebody say amen. amen. This is not psychology today. This is the Bible. The Bible says live for him who died for you. And how do we pay the debt of love that we owe to God? We pay it by loving the people that he created and giving ourselves to others. Brother Lanre and the team yesterday were talking about making sure you don't give God your leftovers. Remember, Brother Lanre, we talked about that? Sometimes people have brought in good, and not, I have to be honest, I haven't seen this since I've been pastor here, where they we're taking a drive for clothing to send to Venezuela or to Honduras or to Guatemala. We've done these things before, and people bring in something that's all torn and got no zipper, it's got no buttons, it's something they would have thrown in the trash, but they think they're going to give it to a missionary and be blessed. Come on now, somebody say, come on now. You may not be from New York, but you can say, come on now. Is that, the, is that what we should give to God, our leftovers? The things we don't want? God gave us his best. Hallelujah. God gave us the treasure of heaven. Thank you, sister. I'm glad somebody's getting this. God didn't give us, and I told you so. You're lucky you're my son. You're lucky I made you, you made it, just made it into the family. And believe me, I won't let you forget it. He washed me. He gave me a new birth certificate. Hallelujah. Washed in the blood of the Lamb. Son of God. Child of God. Hallelujah. The people who have learned the secret. I'm going to tell you a secret now that's worth millions, worth more than millions. Are you ready for this? The people who have learned to always give God first and give God the best have been extraordinarily blessed. I've seen this through history. I've lived long enough to see this played out in real life. People who have put God first and become generous of heart and lived for others, are always better off. Hallelujah. I, I just finished reading this book by David, missionary David Grant called Born to Give. He tells the story of how he was a missionary in India for over 40 years, how he was born to give. When he was 12 years old, he, came, he heard a preacher, Reverend Charles Greenaway, one of the famous pioneer missionaries in the Assemblies of God, tell a story about a little boy who was in a mission service, 12 years old, and he had nothing to give. And when the offering came around for the missionary pledge and the missionary offering, he had no money. So he asked the usher to put the plate down, and he put himself in the plate. <laughs> he stood up in the offering plate, and he says, I want to give myself to God. Well, when, when David Grant heard that story over 40 years ago, he did the same thing. When the offering was taken, he, did, he replicated what that young boy in the story did, and he gave himself to Jesus. As a teenager, he pledged to give half of his income. Now, we're talking about the 1940s, in that period, 1950s. He was making $20 a week as a teenager, and so he gave 50% of his income to God, to missions. So he gave $10 every week, $520 a year. And he lived off that other $10 or whatever, you know, he needed to do. Then as a young adult, when he got a better job, he made a pledge to the Lord. And he said, don't, this is not for everybody. But he decided to wait until he was 30 years old before getting married. He said, I know I'm going to need a wife to go out and be a missionary somewhere. He didn't want to do it on his own. But he said, God, I want to take this time while I'm going to college and I'm earning some money at this part-time work that I do. I want to give everything to you except what I need for food and clothing. That's it. And in those years from the time he was in college, of college age to the time he was 30, are you ready for this? He ended up giving $250,000 to missions by the time he was 30. 
He was born to give. And guess what? You may not be able to give 250000 but you are born to give as well. You weren't born to just think about yourself. Somebody get excited in the house this morning. You were born to give. Give something. Hallelujah. The woman who only had two coins gave what she had. And she was noticed by Jesus. He said to the crowd, see this woman here? Nobody else noticed her, but she just gave her last two pennies. The boy who gave his lunch blessed a crowd of 5,000. Jesus uh, needed a boat to preach because all the crowd was crowding along the beach. And so he borrowed Peter's boat, and he pushed the boat out a little bit, and they held the boat there by the anchor. I don't know how they kept it out there, but they kept it a little ways offshore so he could preach to the multitudes. And after he preached to the multitude, he gave the boat back to Peter. He said, now launch out into the deep water because I got a blessing for you. Hallelujah. All he did was lend him his boat. The Bible says that he who is generous or kind to the poor lends to the Lord. How would you like to lend something to God? <laughs> Have you ever had a creditor who didn't want to lend to you? <laughs> when you first started out, you tried to buy your first house and all the banks turned you down. They were very suspicious of you. But imagine we, you know, human beings, have the ability to lend to God. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I have to find the scripture just in case you don't believe me. How many of you believe me anyway? <laughs> Most of you do. All right, it's Proverbs 19.17. We're skipping ahead here, but I'm going to go back, uh, Monica. Proverbs 19.17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. And he will reward them for what they have done. I didn't make that up. That's the Bible. That's the word of God. Are you with me today? There was a businessman. And by the way, God needs business people too. Not everybody's called to be a pastor. Not everybody can be a missionary. God could use your entrepreneurial skills. If you put him first. Maybe you're a realtor. Maybe you're a homeowner that you rent out your house or whatever it is. Put God first in everything, in everything you do, hallelujah, in word and in deed. There was a man by the name, a businessman by the name of R.G. Letourneau, uh, born in, I can't remember where he was born. I think it was in the Vermont area. And this man was born just prior to the uh, Depression in the early teens, 1918, something like that. And in the 20s and 30s, he became a businessman. He started out with nothing. He left school when he was 14 years old. He had an exceptional skill in mechanics. He enjoyed fixing cars. He enjoyed working on the farm, uh, learning how to use land move like tractors and plows and things like that. Eventually, he learned how to improve on these machines. And he began to file for patents for machinery like bulldozers. And like land movers and excavators, all these big things. And he formed a company called the Litorno Land Moving Company. And they started making thousands and thousands of dollars. But all during this time, he was giving tithes to the Lord. All during this time, he was giving to the missions. And there came a time where he had a terrible reversal. One of the contracts that he had went south. And it was during the Depression. And they could not pay. He owed $100,000. And he went to his accountant, and the accountant says, what are you going to do? You're going to go bankrupt. And the accountant said, don't do any more giving to the church. No more missionaries. No more. He says, you've got to cut that out. And he said, no, sir. No, sir -ry. He says, you see that $5,000 that I promised to the local Baptist church here? I'm going to keep my promise. And he gave that $5,000, and he paid by God's mercy, and somehow supernaturally paid $100,000 back in the debt he owed. And God made him one of the greatest philanthropists in our country. He gave millions and millions of dollars to colleges, institutions, Bible schools, you name it, missionaries. His, uh, his, um, in the 1960s, if I can remember this, his foundation had over $40 million in assets. This is a man who went around after he became so wealthy, he quit his work with Leternal Company 
and went around preaching the gospel and winning people for Jesus Christ. What an amazing story. Eventually, guess what? He lived on 10% of his income and gave 90% to God. And when asked why he could do this, he says, I keep using a shovel. He talked about his machinery shoveling, you know. He says, I've used a shovel with God, but he always has a bigger shovel. And God keeps blessing me back. Today I pray, and I want to come to the end of this. I pray that you'll learn the secret of the blessing of a generous heart. You will remember this Sunday, December 5th, 2021. Remember the message, a key to the blessed life. There's another book we gave out. We didn't give out. We sold them called The Blessed Life by Robert Morris. How many of you have had this book or read the book? How many of you? Some of you. We have some copies in the back, and I'm going to ask Brother Lanre to go back there if you kindly <clears throat> put them on the back table. And these books cost about, I don't know, $20 the price is, but we're going to make them available for $10 today. I, my wife and I read this book, and it's kind of a, a, a story of Mr. Mar uh, Pastor Morris, but it's the same message that I've been giving today, the same message about the blessed life how your life is blessed through service, through giving, and not just money. Are you with me this morning? We're not just talking about money. There's so many things you can give besides money. So we'll make those available to you after the service for $10. And also, I want to give this book away. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I feel like the lead of the Lord. I want to give this book. I only have one of these, Born to Give, the missionary David Grant. Would you like to read it, sir? All right. Come on up here, brother. This man was ready. He was ready. <laughs> because somebody needs to be inspired by the testimony of those who give. Yes, thank you, Lon Ray. Appreciate that. We got a bunch of them back there. For $10, I want to tell you something right now. It will be the best $10 you spent in your life. All right? The book is worth $20, and I'm not a salesman, but I'm just saying the truth. It does say it right on there, $20. But the principles you'll find in there will revolutionize your life. Yes. Yes. That's right. Exactly. If, if you can't afford it, amen, you could borrow the money from Lan Ray. I'm just kidding. <laughs> you knew that was coming. You knew that was coming. Yeah, yeah. He wants you to sign a, uh, an affidavit or something. But... Uh, no, seriously, if you don't have $10, take it. Take, but promise me you'll read it. Word of honor. You'll promise to read it. Amen? You can volunteer for the cause of Christ. There is such a thing as the gift of friendship. And here's where I'm getting ready to close the service here. Gift of forgiveness. Another chance to someone who has messed up. That's a gift. My parents... Get, they didn't have a lot of money, but they had a lot of patience. Come on, somebody. They gave me forgiveness many times. I screwed up many times. I messed up many times. You can give somebody strength when they're troubled. You can give somebody courage to go on. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can give somebody your prayers. You could comfort those who are mourning or grieving. I could go on and on and on. How many of you understand? There's a lot of things we can do to give. You can volunteer. You can write letters to missionaries. Maybe you don't have a lot of money, but you can write a letter to a missionary and say, you know what? I've been thinking about you. I'm praying for you. Send them an email. You don't even have to get out a pen and paper. You could do it right on the computer. Are you with me today? Live an outwardly focused life. Don't be like the little boy who was so spoiled. His parents said to him, whatever you do, you see that expensive vase right there on that china closet or on the buffet table? That is very expensive. That's imported from China. Don't you dare touch it. One day the boy, out of curiosity, went up there and he looked inside. And he saw something he liked and something he thought he needed. And he reached his hand in there to grab it, and then he couldn't get his hand out. 
His hand was stuck. Be sure your sins will find you out. I have a whole story about when I went into some place, a swimming pool, illegally, and I lost my belt. I'm trying to run down the street with somebody chasing me, a, a guard chasing me, and I couldn't run because my pants were falling off. It doesn't get any more embarrassing than that. Come on now. How many of you know God will love you enough to come upside of you sometime and give you a little pow-pow? You need to little snap out of it a little bit. Like Grandma Jane, David, stop thinking about yourself. Angela's mother once time told her, Honey, I prayed for you enough. Now go out and do something for somebody else. <laughs> Am I telling the truth? You want to hear the rest of the story about the boy? Okay. So they tried everything. They put soap in there. They put Vaseline. They could not get this kid's hand out of the jar. Finally, the father got a hammer. He's ready to break the vase. And the boy said, you think if I open my hand and let go of the penny I'm holding <laughs> that it might help? <laughs> hey, duh. You're holding a penny and we're ready to break this $5,000 vase? But isn't that a commentary? And how we're trying to hold on to the things of this world that don't amount to anything at all. You know, when I, I've been at many deathbeds, unfortunately, I've had experience over the years of seeing many people near death. I never remember one time anyone saying, you know, I wish I had invested uh, in bitcoins, or I wish I had bought this stock, or uh, I, I wish I had more jewelry, you know. Right. It was always about, I wish I had forgiven so and so. I wish I had more, showed more love. I wish I was more kind. Friends, the things that God wants you to give are not just money. It's your heart. Hallelujah. It's your heart. Hallelujah. Next week, or this coming Saturday, we're going to have a Christmas open house. It's a great opportunity to invite somebody so that they can find the greatest gift of all. Hallelujah. The greatest gift of Christmas is Jesus. Amen? Uh, I'm going to go off camera for a second, so, but don't, uh, don't shut it off. I'm going to go down here and reach into some of these um, prayer cards that we put in here. If you remember a few weeks ago, we, uh, I'll come back now, we made out cards and we told the story of Aaron the high priest, how he had a golden breastplate with all these uh, expensive stones, precious stones, with the names of the sons of Israel, all the tribes are engraved on those stones. And the Bible says specifically, he wore these names over his heart. So that wherever he went, whenever he went into the presence of God, God would remember to be merciful to sons of Israel. And I ask you to do the same thing. I haven't read these because they're personal and it's confidential. But this morning, I want to hold these over my heart. And symbolically, I want us to pray for these. But I also want you to pray for the ones you took home. You supposedly took a duplicate copy at home, right? Put it on your refrigerator or someplace. I want you to remember that and perhaps invite them for this Saturday. Think of somebody you can invite to come and have some fellowship or for next Sunday for, uh, to hear the word of God next Sunday. Pastor Angel will be sharing the word next Sunday. Think of somebody that you can reach out to. Do you have room in your life for one more person? I know that sounds like a simple question, but the Lord drove that home to me. Sometimes we think our life is so busy, so full, we have no room. We think our problems are so big. We don't have room for anybody. That's sad. Somebody say, that's sad. It's sad that we don't have room for anybody else. Aren't you glad that Jesus had room for you? Hallelujah. Pastor Angel, would you come up here? Let's stand together. I also want to speak this last word to anybody who's discouraged about their giving. And you have lived an outwardly focused life. You have given of yourself. 
You have invested in your others. But you feel discouraged because sometimes you don't see the answers. Is there anybody like that this morning? You know what I'm talking about. You feel like, well, I have prayed and I have given. I have put God first. But I still don't see all the breakthroughs. What I'm saying today is do not be weary in well-doing. Hallelujah. Hang on. Push back against the lie of Satan that says, look, you're a fool. You should just be thinking about yourself. Somebody say, that's a lie. You should just be feeling sorry for yourself. That's a lie. We have the riches of heaven. When I close my eyes on this earth, I'm going to be in glory land. Hallelujah. I'm going to be walking on streets of gold. Hallelujah. But even while I'm here, I still enjoy the riches of Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. David Grant, you know, besides his giving money, he eventually married, and it's an amazing story, Reverend Andrew, but they touched thousands upon thousands upon thousands of orphans in India, and God gave them miraculous doors, and they have trained Go ahead. hospitals, orphanages, Bible schools in 40 years. That's the end of the story, the rest of the story. You'll, you'll read about it. And you could read it online, too. Just look up Missionary David Grant online. You could read his story. And all of these, there's so many. Uh, you want to find out about more, see Marie and Stefan. They have a whole list of missionaries they've studied because I know they like to study missiology. But the point is, there's a work for me to do. Remember we used to sing, Brother, oh, Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, please don't refuse me. Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, please don't refuse me, for surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, and even though it's humble, Lord, cause my faith, of cause my fear to crumble, cause my fear to crumble. And though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Oh, Jesus, use me. Please don't refuse me. Oh, Jesus, use me. Oh, Lord, please don't refuse me. For surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, and even though cause my will to crumble, please cause my will to crumble. And though the cost, and though the cost be great, I'll work for you. Would you close your eyes for a minute? Father God, there is a very noble calling that goes out today. I feel the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Will you go in Jesus' name? Whew. Hallelujah. Will you go in Jesus' name? Will you go as a missionary to your neighbor, as a representative of Christ in your neighborhood, in your family, to the, cl to the clerk that helps you at the store or the teller at the bank. Will you be a, a light for Jesus? Will you give your best to him? Hallelujah. Your time, your talents, your treasures. Put God first and give him your best. Hallelujah. Pastor Angel, would you lay hands on these? We're going to pray, and if you would remember those that you wrote... The names you wrote, you'll hopefully remember some of them. Pastor. Oh, Lord, we just thank you that we have the ability to just give back a small part of what you've given us. Lord, there may be needs in our life, but as we really reflect on your goodness, it's overwhelming. This week I did that. I took some time to write. I couldn't stop writing all the goodness of God to me all the things he's done for us. 
So, Lord, it's all yours. It's all yours, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for the ability to pray, to love others through you, God. And we ask you, Lord, especially for those names that are written on here. God, some are near, some are far. But we ask that you would use us. Lord, maybe we're going to be the answer. The Lord just gave me this word that there are people in other places who have written names down on these. And as we reach out to our neighbors, as we reach out to Meadowoods and beyond, we're going to be an answer to the names they put down. And there are going to be people that God uses that will be the ones that will reach the names that are not close to us, far away. I'm praying for some of my family members today in New York. And Lord, we pray for those close by. Give us favor this week, Lord, to meet with people, to invite them, God, to share your love with them, to bring hope, Lord, in a season that is could be very hopeless for people who don't know you, Lord. So we thank you for using us, Lord. It's a wonder. I never want to get over the wonder that you can use a human being, Lord, someone that you formed, Lord, someone that is could be ordinary in the world's eyes, but extraordinary in your eyes as the Holy Spirit comes upon us and uses us in miraculous ways. Just put your hand in the air. Say, God, use me in miraculous ways. It's not about me. It's about you. And Lord, time is short. We want to be used by you, God. Bless these names, Lord, and beyond. In Jesus' name. Amen, 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 amen. You may be seated. Thank you for sitting down for a second. We're going to take a moment and uh, have the privilege of baptizing our dear sister, Geraldine. Do you want her to stay there, uh, or do you want to bring her up, um, Vicki? Yeah, yeah, bring her up. That would be good. And uh, we're going to <laughs> – Lonre's ready. He's got some water. Good. Okay. Pastor Angela just felt an urging from the Spirit of God, and I, I, I agree. We're going to just give those books away, okay? Here, one condition. Promise to read it. That's all. Amen? It's free of charge, just like salvation is free. The books are free. All right. Sister Geraldine, come on up. Hallelujah. Let's welcome this precious sister. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yet to follow Jesus. I Let's stay together. Huh? Get the audio back. Oh, yeah, yeah. teaches that water baptism is just an outward uh, sign of an inward reality. Water doesn't save you. The water doesn't save you. Amen? But the water and the baptism is a symbol of Christ's death and resurrection so that we are identifying with that in our faith. In our faith, we're saying, I put my hope in Jesus, not in any other God, not my good works, not in the church, not in religion. My hope is in Jesus. He died and he rose again. So that's why I'm getting baptized and rising up again in newness of life. Now, Sister Geraldine, do you love Jesus? All the the time. 
all the time. Amen. Is it your desire to confess your faith in Christ publicly? Thank you, dear. Amen. Amen. Well, upon your confession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority vested in me as a minister of the gospel, I hereby baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Put the light there. Amen. You okay? Now oh, you're all right. Amen. The world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me, the cross before me, the world behind me. Put some anointing oil on it. Put some anointing oil on it. Amen. We just want to do this as well. We want to anoint our sister. I just felt led. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Bible uses oil as a symbol of consecration. Lord, I pray that you give this dear sister many years ahead of her. That she, li she lives a more consecrated life to you. That you will bless her and make her a blessing. I want you to stretch out your hand towards Sister Geraldine. Bless her, Lord, and make her a blessing. In Jesus' name, give her a heritage, a legacy of the righteous. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. Amen. No turning back. No turning back. Hallelujah. We just rise, heavens. To the highest mountain. Come on, church, sing it. And it flows to the low. Valley, yes, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never lose its power. It reaches to the highest heaven, to the highest mountain. Oh, it reaches to the highest mountain yes it does and it flows to the lowest valley amen it's the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will the Lord a mighty hand of praise. Don't forget to see Sister Nikki sign up for the open house. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine according to his great power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the present and throughout endless ages in the church and in Christ Jesus all God's people said. Amen. God bless you. Love each other in Jesus' name. God bless you. I think so. I think so.